today in uh, this talk, I'm going to describe uh, some uh, recent contributions uh, with some of my uh, collaborators, uh, Matt Kunzer and uh, Brooks uh, Page, who are postdocs here at the Alan Turing Institute. And today I'm going to describe some of this work, uh, which consists in a new uh, family of uh, generative models for uh, discrete uh, elements, such as, for example, molecules. And uh, I'm going to show how this uh, a new type of uh, generative models can be actually used to improve the search for new molecules with optimal properties. I'm going to start um, with some uh, motivation from the point of view of the recent advances that we have seen in uh, machine learning uh, recently. We have seen a lot of uh, new uh, generative models that can actually uh, learn uh, from uh, real world data and then, then can be used uh, to generate synthetic but uh, realistic uh, data. For example, images, uh, these model can, models can uh, generate very realistic images and uh, they can also be uh, fitted to, for example, uh, sounds and generate also very uh, realistic sounds for, for, from, for, for, from example, uh, musical instruments. So uh, these methods have been very successful and they have one characteristic that uh, they are uh, applied uh, to data in continuous domains. And uh, when you generate synthetic data in continuous domains, uh, you are more or less uh, tolerant to uh, small uh, uh, misspecifications in the samples that you generate. For example, this is a synthetic sample, uh, a synthetic init generate, generated by one of these uh, models. And we can see that there are some uh, imperfections. For example, the image can be blurry, or we have that in this uh, part of the image, there is some uh, uh, part of the background that appears uh, there. But we can still identify this as a butterfly. And uh, the quality of the sample is still reasonable. Uh, this type of problems, however, uh, are very significant when we try to generate uh, discrete data. For example, uh, discrete uh, elements such as uh, molecules, which we can actually encode as a sequence of characters using a language uh, called uh, smiles. We have uh, other elements such as, for example, arithmetic expressions or even source code in computer programs. And uh, in these uh, types of discrete data, whenever our generative model makes uh, small uh, mistakes, uh, the consequences can be very significant. And for example, in the, uh, in the case of the molecules, if we change just uh, this uh, single character, we won't be able to obtain a valid molecule. And if we run this uh, string encoding a molecule into a biochemoinformatics software, we are going to have uh, errors. So just the smallest uh, mistakes can ruin uh, the uh, uh, validity of these symbols, uh, of these elements. And for example, here, if we have this uh, symbol X, uh, our generative model may make a mistake and uh, uh, we again obtain uh, invalid expressions and uh, for the source code, something similar occurs. We may make uh, small mistakes and uh, the consequence is that when we execute this uh, code, for example, in an interpreter, we are going to have uh, problems. And uh, the difference is that uh, this uh, type of uh, discrete data and the continuous data are different. different. And uh, in the discrete case, we care a lot about these uh, small problems. So ideally, we would like to have uh, generative models that can uh, uh, produce uh, uh, correct uh, discrete uh, sequences. Uh, let's understand why these models make these mistakes. Uh, and I'm going to describe some of the uh, uh, existing approaches for uh, uh, generating uh, for generative models, in particular, something called uh, variation autoencoders, which is probably one of the most uh, uh, successful techniques uh, right now in the area of machine learning. These models, uh, they can uh, receive, uh, they, are, they, they are formed by uh, neural networks. These are neural network type models, and they, have, they are formed by an encoder that uh, receives as input uh, the data and uh, uh, transforms that input into a lower dimensional space. And then there is another decoder that tries to reconstruct the original data from that uh, low dimensional uh, representation. So we can have a, a discrete sequence encoding a molecule like this. We can then uh, transform this discrete sequence into a hidden state uh, representation of that sequence using a recurrent neural network. Uh, a recurrent neural network or convolutional neural networks that can be used uh, for this. So we can encode the characters in this uh, sequence uh, using a one hot encoding representation, so we have a vector with, with one entry for each uh, possible character, 
in the input, and then we have a one in the, the corresponding entry for the character. This is the input to a recurrent neural network that uh, uses those inputs to update a hidden state representation. And that's uh, uh, received by a neural network that projects that into a lower uh, dimensional uh, representation of the data. And interestingly, this uh, low dimensional representation of the data is actually uh, continuous. So we have actually a continuous representation of these uh, discrete elements. We can then use the decoder to map back from this continuous representation of the discrete sequences back to the original space. And we can have a neural network that maps the low dimensional space to a hidden state vector. And then using a recurrent neural network, we can actually uh, obtain a probability distribution over uh, characters uh, from which we can actually sample. Uh, this would be, for example, vectors uh, with probabilities. Uh, one entry in each vector corresponds to a particular character. We can then sample, uh, draw, select one of these elements in the vectors with a probability proportional to the strength of the color in this case, and uh, we would obtain uh, a representation uh, in terms of uh, characters of the latent uh, state. And uh, this would correspond, for example, to the original uh, data. These neural network models are trained on uh, large amounts of uh, data trying to uh, reconstruct uh, from the latent representation uh, the uh, uh, original uh, data that we used as input. And then we can use this type of models to generate a, a new data by just, for example, picking randomly uh, points in this latent, uh, in this latent state uh, representation. We could pick randomly points here and then decode those points back to uh, some uh, discrete sequences and we would uh, be generating uh, this type of elements. The problem is that when we do this sampling, some of the, uh, by chance, some of the elements that we are going to generate uh, may be incorrect and we may have some uh, problems generating the uh, valid uh, sequences. This can be detrimental if we use this type of models also for uh, trying to find uh, new sequences, new discrete sequences or new molecules, for example, with optimal properties, which is something that we can use exploiting the fact that uh, we have this uh, continuous latent representation uh, of molecules. We can actually use uh, uh, these techniques to perform molecule optimization in this uh, latent space. And this would be illustrated in this example. Uh, we can have, for example, here a representation of this latent space. Uh, each point would represent uh, uh, possible points that could decode into molecules. And we may have a, a, a specific uh, measurements from molecules that are mapped to points in this latent space, and we may have some uh, uh, target property that we may be interested in uh, optimizing. This could be, for example, the effectiveness of some particular molecule for treating a disease. We may have data, uh, molecules that are mapped to these points in the latent space, and we could use actually machine learning methods to make predictions about the properties of uh, new points in this uh, latent space. And this would be, for example, illustrated here. You may have a machine learning method that can actually make predictions. We may have actually that in some points in latent space, there are new, uh, they, these points could decode into some molecules with improved properties. And you could use these predictions of this uh, machine learning method to, based on the data that you have already observed, to try to uh, 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 propose novel molecules, collect data for those novel molecules, and uh, iterate the process to uh, try to uh, 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 find the uh, new molecules with optimal properties. This is great. The problem is that uh, all this relays uh, on our decoder, on our neural network that is going to map points in this latent space back to the original space uh, of uh, discrete sequences. And in general, uh, it may happen that uh, all we, what we have are points in this uh, discrete space, and we have to decode uh, those points to obtain the corresponding molecules. For that, we use our decoder, and uh, sometimes the decoder is going to work well. Uh, we are going to uh, map the low dimensional latent space into some hidden state for a recurrent neural network, and then uh, generate uh, some sequence that uh, uh, can correspond to some uh, molecule of interest. The problem is that uh, this sometimes uh, may not work, and uh, sometimes we are going to uh, generate uh, uh, decode uh, using our decoder, and we may have some mistakes and we are not going to obtain uh, valid molecules. So uh, this is pro problematic because it uh, 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 makes uh, 
uh, introduces some difficulties in all this approach for searching for new molecules uh, to work well in practice. And uh, in some points in latent space that we would, for example, make uh, accurate predictions according to our machine learning method, maybe those points uh, won't actually decode into valid molecules. So uh, what is the problem here? The problem is that uh, actually our model has to both learn the patterns and regularities present in the data, for example, the type of uh, regularities that are found in uh, molecules in real world, but also they have to identify and to learn uh, the constraints that define uh, valid molecules in practice. And the idea is uh, uh, that the model has to learn uh, what a molecule, valid molecule is. And uh, this, uh, for this, it would require uh, significant amounts of uh, data. The idea that we propose in this work is to try to avoid this. Ideally, we would like to say, we already know the type of constraints uh, that molecules uh, should uh, have to satisfy. Maybe there is a way in which we can introduce into these generative models uh, based on neural networks uh, those constraints uh, manually. And for that, what we are uh, going to use is precisely a, a context-free uh, grammar. This context-free grammar is going to capture some of these constraints. It turns out that in many of these uh, discrete elements, such as molecules or uh, source code, or even expressions can be uh, described uh, using uh, grammars. These are just a collection of rules in which you have some, uh, uh, just start with some initial symbol and you can apply rules in which uh, the symbols on the left of the rule are replaced by the symbols on the right. You can apply these uh, rules starting from the, from the initial symbol in the uh, grammar and you can obtain a parse tree uh, such that at the uh, roots of the uh, tree, uh, at the leaves of the tree, you actually have uh, the terminal symbols that encode uh, uh, a particular sequence. And uh, uh, with this grammar, when we just uh, generate uh, sequences by just applying the rules in this grammar, we are guaranteed to uh, generate a syntactically uh, valid uh, um, uh, sequences, which is going to be, in general, uh, much more, uh, it's going to lead to uh, much more valid molecules in practice that if, than if we ignored these uh, uh, rules. So uh, what we can do now is if we are given this grammar, we can actually, for each sequence, we can find the uh, parse tree that uh, describes how that sequence is actually generated. And we can now use a generative model over these uh, parse trees in practice. So here this, uh, this uh, sequence, for example, would be applied just by, would be generated by applying these uh, uh, rules in the grammar. We start with initial symbol and then apply the first rule. And then we start uh, applying rules in a uh, uh, top. We, rec we go through recurring the, uh, we go through the tree uh, in a top bottom uh, fashion and also from uh, left to, to right. We are applying uh, uh, the rules in the grammar. And we can just then represent our discrete objects just by the rules in the, the grammar that we apply uh, to generate them. So we can just, instead of working with characters, we can just work with this uh, discrete set of rules uh, encoding the uh, discrete object. So uh, let's see how that would be done. Then our encoder just uh, receives rules uh, that we apply uh, from the grammar to construct uh, the objects uh, instead of characters. This is very similar to what we were doing before uh, and we can use, again, a recurrent neural network to map this to a continuous uh, latent space. Uh, now we have to decode. And uh, because we are now working with rules in the grammar, we would have to decode also into rules. Uh, and uh, we want uh, to produce syntactically correct uh, sequences. So uh, instead of sampling now uh, rules arbitrarily, what we are going to do is to introduce constraints by making use of something called a stack. Uh, a stack is going to be some uh, auxiliary data structure that is going to help us to select uh, uh, valid rules so that at each step, we only apply those rules from the grammar that are uh, the ones that we can apply at that step. So we start with our stack, we initialize it with our uh, initial symbol in the grammar, and then at each step, what we are going to do is to uh, sample uh, one extracted top element from the stack then uh, get the vector of uh, the probability vector for rules that we can apply now. And then we are going to look at the grammar and only uh, consider those rules that start with this uh, left-hand side. So we see that we have 
this uh, grammar and uh, we are going to pick the rule that has the same uh, left hand side as the one that we picked and we are going to mask out all the uh, other elements that would correspond to invalid rules. We can then repeat this process, sample uh, rules uh, from the grammar. This is the rule that we pick. Then the right hand side is uh, uh, moved to, to the stack and the process repeats. We again extract from the stack the next uh, non-terminal symbol and we would be iterating uh, this process. We get the probability vector over uh, um, the probability vector over rules in the grammar, mask out those that do not start with the symbol that we extracted from the stack. Sample uh, from this, we pick one rule from the grammar and we iterate uh, this process. We move to the stack, the right hand side of that rule in the grammar and we would be repeating the, the whole process. So uh, with this approach, we are guaranteed to generate uh, a sequence of rules that uh, form a valid uh, parse tree uh, according to our grammar. And then uh, we have just a generative model that now instead of just generating sequences of characters is actually generating uh, valid uh, parse uh, trees. And uh, we are more uh, likely now uh, to generate valid uh, molecules because we are actually taking into account these constraints introduced uh, by our grammar. So with this model, we can actually generate uh, syntactically correct uh, sequences. And we have now a generative model for discrete objects that are guaranteed to, be, uh, to satisfy a particular grammar. We call this uh, model the uh, grammar variation autoencoder. So how does this uh, work in practice? Uh, we tested this uh, for uh, trying to solve some uh, uh, drug search problem. What we are doing here is just uh, starting with some uh, collection of molecules from a particular data set. Uh, with up to 250,000 molecules. Uh, we uh, try to optimize some uh, metric that we fixed uh, uh, of interest. In this case, it's a, a drug likeness metric. And we can see that the molecules that we identify with uh, taking into account this grammar, is, uh, they actually look more realistic and they produce uh, better values of the metric than those uh, identified with a generative model that uh, doesn't make use of this uh, additional grammar. This is uh, cool, so it seems that it, this uh, approach is uh, helping to find uh, better molecules with improved uh, properties. Uh, but we can also use uh, these models, uh, we can also uh, uh, look into the latent representation that these models uh, generate. We could, uh, these models are basically mapping these discrete molecules into some uh, continuous latent space. We could just uh, pick one point in this latent space, for example, one corresponding to this molecule, and then we could pick just randomly two directions in this latent space and use those two directions as a plane uh, that we could then uh, project uh, in this screen by decoding the corresponding uh, points. And when we do that, we obtain some uh, nice uh, smooth uh, mapping uh, between uh, uh, molecules when we do this decoding. When we look into the details of this and it, we zoom in, we see for example here that many of the elements here have similar structures, but only small uh, atoms in the molecules uh, change. We can then uh, look more, and in this case, we see that there are some uh, more changes in the structures, also other changes in the, in the atoms. And we have that uh, similar molecules are present uh, close to each other in this uh, uh, latent space. This is some uh, representation that was automatically learned uh, from data. And uh, because we have that molecules that uh, are similar are close to each other in this latent space, when we make predictions uh, about the properties of the molecules, uh, we should be able to, uh, uh, to find the new spots in this uh, latent space with uh, better properties. This is another example uh, where we saw that uh, there, are some, there is some smoothness. When we compare with a similar uh, visualization of this latent space using the character-based model, which is uh, done with a uh, the alternative method that ignores this grammar, we see that the smoothness of the space doesn't seem to be uh, as good. And also the uh, molecules that we obtain have some uh, uh, more uh, uh, ad hoc structures. So this is uh, great. It seems to be working with these uh, molecules. Uh, can we test it on something else? And uh, what we proposed, uh, what we did is some uh, additional experiments comparing this with uh, uh, in the problem of generating uh, arithmetic expressions. In this problem, we have some data generated by a ground truth uh, expression. Uh, and what we are going to do is try to do a search uh, 
over uh, expressions, trying to find someone that, uh, some expression that actually fits the data uh, well. And what we are going to use here is this uh, uh, variation autoencoder with a grammar, and we are going to use some optimization in this data in the space to try to find the uh, uh, expressions that fit this data uh, correctly. This shows uh, the ground truth, which is shown in black, um, which is, uh, this, uh, it shows this oscillatory behavior with some amplitude that uh, uh, decreases uh, as we move away from the origin. And we see that we can actually uh, find an, uh, an expression that fits very well uh, the true one. And uh, if we use just the character uh, version of our decoder, the fit is uh, not as good, it's just uh, this straight line which is shown uh, in black. So we're actually able to find uh, an expression that is actually very close uh, to the original expression. We have to say that all this is done automatically. We just have some uh, data uh, in the form of expressions and we feed our models to those data. So we don't have to manually, uh, for example, specify a, a method that would uh, uh, do this uh, search over expressions, for example, using genetic algorithms. We can also do this interpolation between expressions. Uh, when we do that with using, using just a character-based model, we have some expressions that are not syntactically valid. But with our method, we can actually obtain all valid expressions because it's taking into account uh, this uh, grammar that specifies the, the syntax of these uh, expressions. So to conclude some takeaways, uh, we have seen that the uh, discrete data can be often represented as uh, strings. For example, molecules can be encoded uh, as a sequence of characters using this language uh, smiles. This representation is very brittle. Uh, small errors uh, can uh, make all these uh, sequences uh, useless. Uh, and the uh, current uh, generative models that are very successful in machine learning in, in other domains, they suffer in this setting because they uh, don't take into account these uh, strict constraints that these discrete objects uh, have to satisfy. Um, we have proposed this uh, grammar variation autoencoder that makes use of this uh, grammar to introduce uh, some uh, constraints uh, manually into the objects that uh, these models will be generating. And uh, by doing so, uh, we are guaranteed that all our uh, synthetic data is going to be grammatically correct. Uh, and uh, this uh, seems to uh, improve search uh, to find, for example, uh, molecules with better uh, properties. So I think that's all uh, what I wanted uh, to talk to you. I think this is a very promising approach. Uh, it's a still very early stage. This is something that we have been working uh, very recently only during the last uh, year or so. But I think this is uh, a collection of techniques that uh, can have a significant impact in the way uh, uh, that uh, a significant impact in how uh, you can uh, search for uh, new molecules with optimal properties. Thanks a lot for your attention and I will be very happy to answer any questions. That was really, really interesting, and I'm glad to see context-free grammars, which I remember spending many hours wrestling with being used in real life. So um, does anybody have any questions for Jose? A question over here. Yes, the gentleman in the, in the tan shirt. Thanks. Um, I mean, the chemistry work looks really promising, I guess. So I, I come from a sort of conventional chemomathematics background and producing big libraries of chemically reasonable, grammatically correct molecules is only part of the problem. The second part is often, how do you score those against things like potency or metabolism or things like that? So have you done anything that suggests that working in this kind of autoencoder representation improves the performance of those sorts of predictive models? Um, so right now, yeah, so that's, that's uh, one uh, very interesting problem, like how to make predictions uh, uh, for molecules, and there are many different ways, many different machine learning techniques that you could use. Uh, you could use these techniques because we find this uh, latent representation, and you can use that latent representation to make predictions, but you could ignore that uh, and maybe use other techniques that are, don't use that latent representation. Right now, the state-of-the-art uh, techniques for making predictions about properties of molecules uh, are convolutional neural networks on graphs. These are neural networks that receives, receive uh, graphs as an input and they, are, they don't uh, learn this uh, continuous latent representation. Those techniques uh, obtain state-of-the-art state results. What we have seen uh, in some uh, other work that I didn't mention here is that uh, you can also uh, uh, perform predictions using this latent representation and you obtain uh, comparative results 
it's not uh, significant, but you could say that uh, both seem to be very, very similar in practice. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, John? <clears throat> I think this might be an extension of the last question, and maybe I'm a bit confused, but it sort of reminded me about the relationship with the linear sequence of, of um, um, uh, nucleic acids and the difficulty of predicting the structure and function of a protein from. <laughs> from that, there's a lot of intermediate stages, a lot of, and and this is a kind of topolog topological abstraction of, of of something which is got a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics, a lot of three-dimensional geometry, which is actually going to determine. Uh, whether, so I don't quite understand why being able to determine whether something is syntactically valid, what that's going to tell you about the function, and what's going to be an interesting molecule for a particular yeah. purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So the. The interest in this type of models is that uh, we, when you do this uh, uh, drug discovery, you have to come up with candidates. Uh, you may have already some information about uh, some existing drugs or so, and you say, I want to treat this, a particular disease, and want to suggest uh, potential molecules that uh, could uh, be used for this. And then uh, the goal is, I want to really suggest uh, molecules that are going to be uh, having, for example, uh, useful properties, but uh, they are going to be also, uh, for example, uh, easy to synthesize or uh, um, satisfy some specific constraints. And uh, the idea is to create uh, generative models that uh, uh, could be trained from previous data and would be able to uh, suggest uh, such candidate molecules in this case. So there's only one potentially many constraints and sources of information yes. so to determine yes. whether that candidate is actually promising or not. Yeah, so there are many constraints that, uh, you should, be, that should be taken into account. Like, for example, the cost of uh, synthesizing molecules, if this is possible or not. This is like a very uh, simple abstraction of the problem. You could think of uh, having, for example, multiple objectives and then doing a multi-objective optimization in this latent space to try to find some... Uh, a collection of molecules that satisfy, satisfy some optimal trade-offs between uh, your constraints. But that's al always something that depends on the specific application that you want to uh, address. Are there any other questions? In here. Uh, how does, on average, the grammatic similarity relate to something like pharmacophore or chemical fingerprinting similarity measures? Um, so this is something that, so the, the fingerprints that you mentioned, uh, they are commonly used, and these are usually uh, created beforehand. Uh, so it's not, it's not something that depends on the data. This uh, type of techniques, for example, they learn from data, this latent representation. And uh, if you want to make, for example, uh, predictions uh, about some properties, you could uh, think of a, a learning art representation that is uh, good also for making uh, those predictions. Uh, for a particular problem of interest. The fingerprints, for example, are just uh, general representations. And maybe in some particular problems, they are going to work well, and in others, maybe they are not so good. Uh, the advantage of these techniques is that uh, you uh, learn this representation from data, and you would be able to tune that representation to the characteristics of the problem that you want to solve. Okay, we've got time for one more. Pinchy. Thanks, Jose, for that talk. So. Um, so it sounds so you're finding a low-dimensional embedding of mm -hmm. these molecules, and ostensibly it looks like it's doing that based on the structure. <laughs> but uh, structure, I think the question, basically, uh, the link of structure to functional use or side effects or any of these other things is less. Is that something that's obvious, or is there a link that already exists, or even the ability to synthesize? Um, are two things that are more similar in structure more easy to synthesize? Yes. Right? So what's the relationship between structure and actual like properties that people tend to yeah, use? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's an important uh, uh, question. And uh, uh, all these uh, applications of machine learning uh, to, uh, in chemoformatics, they relay on the fact that uh, molecules that have similar structures, they tend to exhibit uh, similar properties. And that's why we can uh, actually uh, use machine learning methods to extrapolate uh, towards, for example, uh, new uh, molecules for which we don't have data based on uh, past data. It is true that uh, uh, there are many uh, factors, for example, that uh, uh, this type of models are not taken into account. For example, uh, this, this type of models only look at the 
uh, as these sequences, but you could think of, for example, uh, the 3D structure of the molecule. The 3D, so this, this, uh, these sequences only tell you about the components of the molecule, but uh, maybe they are like uh, 3D uh, uh, characteristics of the molecule that could have some effect on the properties. And these models, they don't have actually a, a way to know uh, about this. So that's something that you could say, if you collect uh, data, uh, maybe you can uh, try to uh, tune your representation to correct for this, but it's something that uh, uh, would be inefficient always. Uh, in, in general, it's a challenging problem. Uh, whenever there are no uh, connections between this uh, representation of the molecules that you use and the properties that you want to predict, uh, there is not much you can do. <laughs> 